On Sunday morning, in his first full length, the massacre, the white... On BBC Two now, a revelation from Time Watch and the real story about the war in Korea. Forty-five years after the start of the Korean War, a memorial is dedicated by the presidents of the United States and South Korea. As tens of thousands of Americans died in Korea. Our South Korean allies lost hundreds of thousands, soldiers and civilians. Our other UN allies suffered grievous casualties. Only now is the war giving up its secrets. June the 25th, 1950. The army of communist North Korea crossed the 38th parallel and swept deep into the south. The start of a brutal three-year conflict. Was it a civil war or part of a global plot by Stalin's Soviet Union? Then, and for the next four decades, Moscow denied any involvement. At last, with the opening of the state archives, the Soviet role is finally being exposed. All this was unknown. It all remained absolutely secret, locked up in the archives. Even the Ministry of Defense had very little information about it. It was all kept in the Politburo archives, and the commission, which I've been heading for two years now, has declassified and opened all these files, and it is now known. The communists always claimed that the war was started by the South. This telegram, sent to Stalin by his ambassador in North Korea, General Shtikov, conclusively shows that the North attacked the South with Stalin's full knowledge. The troops went to their start position by 2400 hours on June the 24th. Military activities began at 0440 local time. The attack by the People's Army took the enemy completely by surprise. The new material has blown the gap, as it were. It has exposed beyond question the extent to which Stalin and the Soviet Union were involved in the war, first to last. Hitherto, we've had uh, direct evidence that uh, they were there uh, on the periphery, uh, and we've had good reason to suspect they had political influence, but a lot of that was suspicion. Now we know beyond question. We can now show how Stalin's covert war was fought. But are there still secrets which the Russians dare not reveal? The Japanese occupation of Korea was ended by defeat in World War II. The victorious Russians and Americans divided the country at the 38th parallel. In 1948, the superpowers withdrew. In the South, the Americans had installed Syngman Rhee, a long-standing nationalist leader. For the North, Stalin chose Kim Il-sung as leader of the communist regime. He'd been a captain in the Soviet Red Army. Kim rapidly gained confidence and developed his own agenda to reunite Korea. Did Stalin directly encourage Kim Il-sung to attack the South? I'm his former assistant and translator, and I and my comrades saw many of the documents addressed to him. And I can absolutely confirm, Stalin did not encourage Kim. Soviet documents reveal that Kim asked Stalin for permission to attack the South. American academic Dr. Catherine Weathersby has been given unique access to the archives of the former Soviet Union. Stalin considered this request from Kim Il-sung for nearly a year, from March 1949 to January 1950, before he finally approved it. 
he a number of times said no over the course of 1949. It was not advisable, was the word that was always used. It was not advisable or not expedient for North Korea to engage in offensive action against South Korea. Kim's persistence finally paid off. He was able to overcome Stalin's fear that a war would risk igniting global confrontation. Stalin would not have allowed the war to be started at all if he had thought that the Americans were going to intervene. The initial involvement was undoubtedly on the understanding that Kim Il-sung was going to pull off a quick victory against the weak um, South Korean forces uh, and present the world with a fait accompli. My impression is that Kim Il-sung sold the Korean War to Stalin with a proposition that there would be no opposition and that he thought it was a free way of picking up uh, territory and maybe undermining the American position in Japan. I don't think it was an idea that was hatched in Moscow. It was an idea that became approved in Moscow. Stalin finally agreed in principle to Kim's plan in a telegram dated January 1950. Stalin's message was as cautious as it was mercenary. I understand the dissatisfaction of comrade Kim Il-sung, but he should realize that such an immense operation of the sort he wants to undertake in relation to South Korea requires much preparation. The operation should be organized in such a way that risk is minimized. Stalin then goes on to say that the Soviet Union is experiencing a sharp insufficiency in lead and would uh, be very appreciative if North Korea could provide the Soviet Union with a yearly minimum of 25,000 tons of lead. And uh, I hope that Comrade Kim Il-sung will not refuse us in this. It's very uh, godfatherish. A divided Korea was a buffer zone between the communist bloc to the north and American-occupied Japan to the southeast. Stalin was seduced by the idea of one of his client rulers eliminating America's only ally in mainland Asia. Five months later, the North Koreans were ready, under Soviet military guidance. The invasion operation was devised by the Soviet advisors to the North Korean army. A battle plan was handed to us on tracing paper. It was put together by Russians. The Soviet generals and colonels drew it up, and then it was translated by the Korean officers attached to their staff. So, this blitzkrieg operation was drawn up on a minute-by-minute -minute basis following the Soviet command's plan. The North Koreans staged a deception to blame the war on the South. In order to provoke a war and show that the war had been started by the South Korean side, two days before the military operation started, the North Koreans put some of their units into green border guard uniforms. They then made an incursion into South Korean territory, drawing the South into battle, and the South Koreans started shooting at the North Korean border guards. Kim Il-sung had convinced Stalin that total victory would be achieved within a matter of days. Stalin sent Kim Il-sung a letter in which he already congratulates him on his coming victory. This document exists. Stalin signed himself Fun Si, he always used the pseudonym. But his congratulations were premature. <laughs> 
Within hours of the attack, the United Nations had condemned the invasion in a resolution drawn up by the Secretary General, Trigvili. At uh, midnight yesterday, I was informed that the conflict appeared to have broken out in Korea. I immediately dispatched telegrams to the United Nations Commission in Korea asking for a report. The Russians were not able to exercise their veto at the Security Council. They were absent, boycotting the UN over its refusal to recognize the new communist China. Troops from the United States and 21 other countries were sent to South Korea. Stalin was extremely concerned about the American intervention. He ordered his advisors pulled back from the front line, even though that made it very difficult for the North Koreans to carry out the war. He ordered Soviet ships to return to their ports. He made no public statement, no diplomatic statement in support of North Korea for a week. The communists had misjudged the international reaction. They didn't take into account that the Americans and their allies would react so quickly to the aggression of the North, yet they all reacted straight away. UN troops began to push back the North Korean army. A task force under General MacArthur staged a daring amphibious landing at Incheon, and the UN forces swept north toward the Chinese border. Chinese read the run of battle rather better than the Russians did. And as early as the beginning of August, they were saying to themselves, the North Koreans have uh, lost the battle. From that moment, they began to make movements deliberately towards building up their forces in northeast China. China's communist rulers had been in power for only two years. They feared an American-led invasion. On October the 19th, Mao Zedong ordered his army to attack. Hundreds of thousands of troops threw the UN back past the 38th parallel. Despite their success, the Chinese peasant army urgently needed sophisticated Soviet military support. Mao turned to Stalin. We know the wording of his telegrams now and the actions of his intermediaries, um, saying, look, we need your help and Stalin made various promises, some of which he ratted on. The most prominent of those was withholding uh, our support when the Chinese came into Korea, uh, a defection on his part, which caused Mao to have a nervous breakdown for 24 or 36 hours. Stalin <laughs> Stalin was in a dilemma. Failure to support Mao would weaken his leadership of the communist bloc. But fighting the American Air Force could trigger a world war. Stalin finally agreed, sending Soviet Air Force units to the Korean border. Elaborate precautions were taken to disguise their arrival. Captain Boris Abakumov was a pilot with the Soviet display team. An instruction came from above to send a group of pilots to China. They dressed us in Chinese uniforms so that our Soviet uniforms wouldn't attract prying eyes. We wore reddish-brown boots, cotton trousers, like workers used to wear, tucked into the boots, and green dress jackets. We had no documents on us except for a small badge with Mao Zedong on it. We wore that and that was all. The only thing we had in our pockets was some money, a small sum in yuan. That's all we used down there. They dressed us in Chinese uniform, and later we flew on to Andung Airdrome. We pretended that we went there, 
that these were neither Russian nor Soviet forces. Stalin prohibited his pilots from flying far from communist airspace. The war in the air was fought over the Yalu River on the Chinese-Korean border. It was called MiG Alley, and there UN aircraft were locked in mortal combat with the Soviets. At first, the Russian MiG-15 jet fighter reigned supreme. Christmas 1950, the United States began to send the Sabre, their new F-86 jet fighter, to Korea. Outnumbered but not outfought, a thin silver line of flashing Sabres has sent hundreds of communist jets. We had to take off, use the maximum climb altitude to conserve fuel, and then wait to see what would happen. And it's like gambling in Las Vegas. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. All encounters were real fast. You know, if you didn't do it within 10 to 15 seconds, you probably wouldn't get them. Only now are Soviet pilots disclosing their combat role. So when we reached Korean airspace, we noticed them the 12 sabers were trying to catch up with us. They dispersed and the third pair opened fire on me. Another burst hit my wings. I looked down. My hand was on the throttle and I could see the bone in my arm. It was broken. After that, the shooting stopped and they decided to eject. Western intelligence knew that the Soviet military was heavily engaged in the war. I personally sent a report to Washington that I compiled, which was, which was made official by Washington, that there are actually 22,000 Soviet combat troops involved in Korea, actually involved in the fighting. These were advisors, tanks, and so forth. Their tanks were run by Soviets. Their the MiGs across the border were all Soviet controlled, not Chinese, because we picked up the voices during combat. They had 200 MiGs right over the border, and uh, our policymakers won't let us bomb them. In Washington, President Truman kept quiet about the Soviet presence in Korea. He feared a public clamor for war with the Soviet Union. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted, to see that the security of our country and the free world is not needlessly jeopardized, and to prevent a third world war. Stalin also sought to avoid a world war. The fighting in Korea was showing only too clearly the growing might of the United States war machine. American Air Force was in the process of dropping 600,000 tons of bombs on the north, devastating the cities and decimating the civilian population. Stalin was convinced that it was only a matter of months before the Soviet Union faced such destruction. At the very end of the Korean War, the Russians were concerned that it might trigger a, a third world war. Or above all, they interpreted, or Stalin interpreted, the Western build-up as a prelude to a Third World War, because he was incapable of believing that one would build up forces and then not use them. Stalin knew that the Soviet military urgently needed to catch up with the West's technical superiority. He ordered a full-scale intelligence operation in Korea. We've seen why Stalin came into the war, but he was an opportunist. And once the battle was joined with the United Nations forces, 
clearly there were going to be opportunities to discover uh, a good deal about equipment, uh, weaponry, uh, aircraft and so on. If you have got a conflict between two major blocks, superpowers, and especially in the case of the Korean War, this was early-ish days of the Cold War, the possibility of A, managing to find out exactly the capabilities of the other side's equipment, B, perhaps even getting hold of this equipment, so you can then test it yourself, C, capturing and interrogating the users, this would all be a massive advantage to the Soviet Union. Information obtained from prisoners of war would be vital. But first, the Soviets had to keep them alive in the face of extreme brutality by the North Koreans. In 1950, uh, the North Korean treatment of prisoners was appalling. With rare exceptions, uh, prisoners were denied treatment for wounds or sickness. They were shot arbitrarily on the line of march. Uh, they were denied uh, food and water. People drank water out of the paddy fields and thus got dysentery and all sorts of diseases and so on. And a great number of prisoners uh, died early on uh, and continued to die through the winter. In December 1950, North Korean brutality caused a major intelligence blunder. An American RB-45 aircraft was shot down. On board was a very senior intelligence officer, Colonel John R. Lovell. The American government has always believed that he died in the crash. Time Watch has discovered that he was captured. One of his interrogators, a Soviet officer, Pavel Fironov, says he was asked to attend Lovell's interrogation. When we went in, the North Korean general was particularly incensed that the prisoner didn't get to his feet, that he didn't stand up. After all, this was a general. The man was on his territory. He was undoubtedly a prisoner. This behavior angered him. The prisoner was carrying a highly classified manual on the Soviet order of battle. In this manual, there were a lot of photographs of commanding officers in our Air Force, plus brief biographies of them. Stalin's son, Vasily, was in there, so too was Krasovsky, Marshal of Aviation. But before Fironov could organize a second interrogation, disaster struck. The North Korean general, angered by Colonel Lovell's belligerence, had him marched to the local town, a placard with the words war criminal hung round his neck. Lovell was beaten to death by the local people. He was the most senior American intelligence officer to be captured during the war. Acts like these caused the Russians to remove UN prisoners from the North Koreans. The Chinese took charge of all POWs. They cooperated with Soviet intelligence. Only now are the Russians admitting that they were involved in the interrogations, disguising their nationality. Мункуев у нас из переводчиков был Мункуев, вот Николай, который бурят. One of our translators was a man called Nikolai Munkuyev. He was a buriat with the Mongolian features, and therefore he was allowed to be seen. As far as I recall, he dealt essentially with prisoner interrogations and actually took part in interrogations. Essentially, the questions were about tactics. The questions were tailored to each prisoner. I particularly want to stress that we had the opportunity to meet Americans who had been taken prisoner by the Koreans or Chinese, so that if we wanted to talk to them and question them, we were able to do so. The interrogation uh, process, uh, there was not much physical violence. It was mainly uh, psychological, particularly uh, when they wanted a germ warfare confession. Uh, uh, from me. Uh, they uh, threatened to execute me and uh, marched me out to a uh, mock execution, um, uh, which was 
an attention getter initially and uh, lost his effectiveness for a while, but there was a lot of uh, that and a lot of uh, keeping you awake, waking you at odd hours, and uh, trying to generally break your will so that you would uh, uh, confess and then they could dictate whatever type of confession they wanted from you. They made that s the, s the statement numerous times that uh, uh, if we didn't cooperate or I didn't cooperate with them that uh, there would be no chance for my ever seeing my family again and implications that uh, if I did not confess to these crimes and write them out by tomorrow uh, that if they would come in and take me out and, and dispose of them. According to Soviet documents, they interrogated 262 U.S. Air Force pilots and crew. These are some of the 57 preliminary interrogation reports the Russians have declassified. All relate to air crew who were later released. None of the dossiers on the men who did not return has been opened to the West. These dossiers were considered so important that as this interrogation report shows, they were sent directly to the top Soviet leaders, including Stalin, Molotov and Beria. In this report, a pilot describes U.S. tactics in detail. This interrogation includes a diagram of the F-86 radar gun sight, a piece of technology in which the Soviets were particularly interested. In this, another pilot had drawn an exact map of one of the major U.S. air bases. In another, a plan of the U.N. flight routes. The Russians have made a big display of candor by opening some of their archives. But are they hiding the one last great secret of the war? Were American and UN prisoners taken to the Soviet Union and never returned? During the war, intelligence officer Colonel Philip Corso received numerous reports of POWs being moved to Soviet territory. A number of sightings occurred at the main Soviet Chinese border railway station, Manchuli. Some of the reports after a while I started to show up that some of our prisoners were being taken out of the camps and sent north, some to China, some to the Soviet Union. So I made that as a priority. To, I put that aside as a priority to investigate. Then I got a report that a train load had left to Manchuria to Manchuli. And Manchuli is on the border of Manchuria and the Soviet Union, or Siberia. <laughs> Then a little later on, I received another report that another train load went up there. That made two train loads. Colonel Corso says he later went to brief President Eisenhower about the captured men. One particular instance I went was C.D. Jackson, who was special assistant to the president. I went with him, and both of us walked when the deal of office of the President Eisenhower. And I had to report with me on the Russian, the prisoners that have been sent to the Soviet Union. And I covered with him, and I told him, Mr. President, of course you realize that none of these prisoners will ever come back alive. Because these prisoners are now in the hands of the KGB and GRU. There is evidence that a small group of highly specialized prisoners, including F-86 pilots, were taken to the Soviet Union. Paul Cole spent three years investigating what happened to these men for the American Department of Defense. I testified before the Senate Select Committee in 1993 that uh, about 35, which I must emphasize is a rough estimate, about 35 uh, American servicemen were taken from Korea to the USSR during the Korean War. And I think over the uh, last year and a half that um, other evidence has only supported that hypothesis and, and um, tending to our conclusion. In some cases, the Chinese handed captured pilots directly to the Soviets. Chinese officer Xu Pinghua conducted captured prisoners from the front line. I remember very clearly that we escorted three American pilots. They were in the second batch of prisoners. Just as we were about to set off, the Army Service Depot asked us to wait so it could escort these three pilots. One of them was an F-86 pilot. At that time, I didn't know what the F-86 was. The other two were P-51. They were all wounded, 
their faces were bandaged. We were asked to escort them to Chang'adun. Shu recalls that the name of the F-86 pilot was Davis. Major George A. Davis is the only pilot of that name shot down, listed as missing in action on 10th February 1952. This is remarkably close to the time when Shu took charge of the prisoners. He delivered the pilots to his headquarters and was told they were being handed over to Soviet officers. There were a lot of comrades in there. I recognized the director of my department. I also noticed that there were four or five people who wore Chinese volunteer force, padded uniforms and hats, but I'm sure they were Soviet personnel. They had an interpreter and they spoke Russian. One of the strongest pieces of evidence for such a human pipeline came from the head of the Soviet Air Force in the war, General Georgi Lobov. Before his death in 1993, he said this. I know that in the summer of 1952, at least 30 to 40 American POWs were placed in a closely guarded carriage attached to a goods train and sent to the USSR. They must have been a treasure trove. I think that it was from these very men that our intelligence people's remarkable knowledge came. The Soviets also wanted captured equipment. The big prize was to get hold of the F-86, which was knocking the MiG-15 out of the sky at a ratio of 7 to 1. In one dogfight, our pilot Pepilayev damaged an American Sabre and it landed out in the estuary on the sand and the aircraft wasn't destroyed. The Americans came in in force and managed to rescue the pilot, but they left the aircraft behind. Well, the Koreans and Chinese quickly camouflaged it there, and to cut a long story short, this aircraft ended up with us at the Andung Air Base. I saw it there with my own eyes. Later, the Sabre was sent to Moscow. These are photographs of the aircraft from the Russian archives. In May 1952, an even better opportunity arose with the capture of both the new F-86E model and its pilot, 34-year-old Colonel Bud Mahurin. He was commander of one of the two American F-86 wings in South Korea. As I circled the target, I saw a truck going down the highway, and, and I thought, well, I'll just go down and shoot that truck up and then go home, and I'll have a big-time story to tell the people at the bar. And, Unfortunately, I got slowed down, and just as I started to fire at the truck, it turned off the road, and uh, I got hit with uh, uh, what I assumed to be 40 millimeter cannon fire. When the airplane hit the ground, it broke up into two pieces and rolled over twice, and I ended up upside down uh, with the canopy gone, and all I had to do was unfasten my safety belt, and I fell out into the mud. Four days later, General Lobov sent an urgent telegram to Moscow stating that the F-86 was to be transported to the Soviet capital. Colonel Mahurin was captured and taken prisoner. The F-86 plane is almost completely intact. The telegram states that Mahurin was already being interrogated for vital information about reinforcements. The captured pilot informed us that the 51st fighter wing is being reinforced by a third squadron. In the near future, the 4th and 51st wings are going to be brought up to their full strength of 150 F-86 planes. Electronics expert Vladimir Matskevich says he interrogated Mahurin shortly after his capture. <laughs> He had a burning desire and had written statements to this effect. 
that our countries should be on friendly terms. Otherwise, Russia and America would destroy each other. He expressed his political opinions and that sort of thing. But what was important, he said, was that America and the Soviet Union had to be on friendly terms and not be involved in confrontation. Colonel Mahorin says that he never met Matskevich or any Russian and never divulged any significant military information. From my memory, I never talked to anybody that came in sort of uniquely from the outside and started to interrogate. And the questions they asked were not the kind of questions that an educated a person who was familiar with flying operations, aircraft and whatnot, would, would even... They were all dumb questions, so to speak. Mahorin's downed F-86 was shipped to the Air Force's secret research institute. Several Soviet veterans say an unidentified pilot was taken with an F-86 to Moscow. Yuri Klimovich was a junior aircraft designer at the time. One day a pilot, a young captain of about 26 years of age, was invited to come along and give a lecture about the F-86's equipment and controls. He was also supposed to talk about any technical flight characteristics of the F-86. The head of the institute told me that the pilot had been brought straight from the Lubyanka, and he was taken back there afterwards. This F-86 pilot was an American. I talked to some people in Washington, and they also wanted to know if I'd been taken to Russia. And I said, absolutely not. Well, obviously, I would know if I went across the Yellow River, because it's a big river. And if I'd gone across on a truck or at night or whatever else, I would have known that I went across that river. Because once you're a POW, you're keenly aware of everything that goes on around you, every sound and every nuance and every inflection in a voice and all that, because that's all you have to live for never happened. I was in solitary the entire time. I never talked to other POWs, and, and so I couldn't have gone with a group of other people anywhere, or I would have known it. I was interrogated by North Koreans, uh, predominantly, and I, my assumption is that it was about uh, two months worth of interrogation, and at that point, uh, Chinese interrogators took over. And uh, initially, it was sort of superficial until all of a sudden, the context of the interrogation changed and it began to be uh, an allegation of, that we had waged germ warfare against the, the enemy. Principal. Colonel Mahurin says the Chinese held him in solitary confinement and eventually forced him to sign a confession admitting to germ warfare, part of their propaganda campaign. He retracted the confession upon repatriation. Uh, I made a confession that was not a confession that had any basis in fact whatsoever. The confession I made was ridiculous, uh, preposterous. Our country had never waged germ warfare under, under any stretch of the imagination, nor had any other members of the United Nations. I concluded that, that it had been 16 months since I had been shot down, so our country and the United Nations had more than ample time to come up with a rebuttal to that allegation and uh, if, if I confessed and put enough implausible things in my confession to make it look silly, uh, then I would get to go home. In March 1953, Stalin died. We know also from the documents that the armistice could not have been concluded without Stalin's approval. And consequently, because Stalin did not think that it was necessary to reach an armistice settlement, at least not necessary to make any significant concessions to do so, an armistice was never reached. Uh, it was only after his death that the Soviets, the Chinese, and the North Koreans were able to move toward reaching an armistice. Hanmunjom, Korea, 1953. 
Operation Big Switch. The After the war, the Colonel Mahorin was exchanged, along with thousands of other POWs, in Operation Big Switch. The end of the Korean War was greeted with euphoria, but the question of the missing servicemen placed President Eisenhower in a difficult position. He had evidence that the Soviets were holding UN prisoners, but Moscow maintained they had had no involvement in Korea. With the threat of nuclear world war, Eisenhower didn't want confrontation over this issue. Political interest in the missing faded. Only with the end of the Cold War, 40 years later, has it become possible that the relatives of missing men might get an answer. Even if one American has been detained in my country and can still be found, I will find him. I will get him back to his family. After Yeltsin's visit to the United States in 1992, a joint American-Russian commission was set up to investigate the fate of the missing. Former inmates of the Soviet Gulag system have begun to come forward with reports of Western prisoners. In response to one appeal alone, some 26 survivors of the prison camps recalled sightings of American servicemen during the Cold War. There was an uprising in the camp, and a rebels committee was set up. They announced that there were American prisoners in our camp. I asked who they were. I was told they were servicemen from the American army. The most reliable sighting of an American-Korean war prisoner is that of Marine Sergeant Philip Mandra, listed as missing on the 7th of August, 1952, after fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Irene Mandra has been trying to establish what happened to her brother. I searched for people that were up on the hill with my brother, and they verified that he was captured. They explained to me that they were under heavy um, fire, and my brother, um, a concussion grenade was thrown at my brother and knocked him unconscious and the man next to him was wounded and two Chinese officers came up on the hill and tried to drag the other officer away. He fought them off and ran down the hill leaving my brother unconscious. They returned, a whole bunch of Marines went back up again and within 15 minutes these boys were all gone. Five Marines disappeared on that hill. Not one body was found. In the early 1960s, Colonel General Malinin was checking on the civil defense preparations at the Magadan labor camp, one of the most notorious gulags in the Soviet Far East. In a special KGB prison, he noticed one particular inmate being kept in isolation. I looked down into the yard and saw a man walking around with an armed guard at his side. I stood there for a minute chatting with the commandant. I asked, who's that you have got down there? Does he know the drill? Is he a prisoner? He replied, he's not just a prisoner, he's an American spy. I asked, does he speak Russian? No, he doesn't. Three years later, Malinin saw the same prisoner again. It was in the summer. I don't remember which month. It was so long ago. He wasn't wearing a flying jacket or a uniform. He was wearing a hat, sort of a brown color, without a peak. So you could see his face. That man looked like this. And as it turns out, his name was Philip Mandra. Philip Mandra. The Russian side said there's no such prison, there's no such window that you could look out, there's no courtyard, 
and they just felt that the story was fabricated. And I asked Colonel Malinan to draw me the prison. And I handed over the sketch to the American side. And they, in turn, on their trip to Markadown, found this prison, found the courtyard, found the window that Colonel Malinan said he was looking out. Everything Colonel Malinan said, they found to be true. This gives him a great deal of credibility. Siberia was the kingdom of the KGB. Here, millions of Soviet citizens were worked and starved to death in camps like this. For the families who want to know the fate of their loved ones, there is still no answer. The Joint Commission have been hamstrung by their lack of political authority to challenge the still powerful KGB. General Volkogonov, the head of the Russian side of the commission, admits they have so far failed. I believe that the system was capable of anything. I believe that under Stalin anything was possible, absolutely anything. And now there are some indications, or to be more precise, unverified reports, that a certain number of Americans were brought to the Soviet Union. But we do not have any hard evidence, say someone has told us they saw them. We can find no confirmation, no document, for example, no facts to corroborate this. So once again we are left with a blank spot in our history. Until such time as we are convinced one way or another, I don't want to close the case. We can't close it until the answers have been found. My personal view is that uh, you have uh, uh, to make a decision whether you think that the Russians are either massively incompetent on a cosmic scale or uh, deceptive, or both. Were there American prisoners on Soviet soil? Of course there were. What became of them? There were only two possible fates for them. Either they agreed to work with us and then they would have survived and lived a long life, or, if they didn't agree to cooperate, they would have received long sentences in the camps and perished there. They want your son during wartime, but they, what do they do once your boy disappears? Do they stick to their guns to, to look for these boys? They, they consider them missing in action, and then after a year or so, they just classify them dead and they close the book on them. The books and documents that can disclose the last great secret of the Korean War lie firmly closed within the KGB archives. President Yeltsin seems unwilling or unable to open them. Mm -hmm.